What should happen with city-owned land that Seattle is no longer using? Should it be sold to the highest bidder or given away to create more affordable housing? The private market ain't doing it, so someone has to, right? I see it as a great opportunity. Yeah, let's clap on that. The city council recently made affordable housing its top priority when city departments sell off surplus land. But how much impact will this policy have in our rapidly growing city? It's going to allow some production. This isn't going to solve anything. And can a new surplus land plan affect deals that are already in the works? Past administrations have used the sale of land to plug budget holes. Our studio panel weighs in. Acquiring land is the biggest hurdle to getting a housing project off the ground. Where is next? Where are the great sites next to light rail or other community amenities? Pushing public land for the public good. Next on City Inside Out. Welcome to this edition of City Inside Out. I'm your host, Brian Callanan. The Seattle City Council has just passed a new resolution to make affordable housing the top priority when it comes to the use of surplus city land. But what sounds like a great new tool to deal with exploding property values has plenty of challenges, too. Some critics say the new measure could put the city in legal trouble. Others say it doesn't go far enough in dealing with a housing crisis Seattle already has a late start on. This week, we're examining the complex issue of surplus land, from the local officials trying to use it for housing to the booming real estate market they're wrestling with. They're the places you might pass by without even noticing. But Seattle's surplus city land sites may provide a key to dealing with our affordable housing crisis. The reuse and disposal of real property owners. That's the Seattle City Council's idea through a new measure sponsored by Council Member Teresa Mosqueda. I'd move to amend resolution 31837. Now, anytime the city sells surplus land, like old staging areas for DOT projects, affordable housing has to be the top priority for the buyer. If the land is used for any other purpose, 80% of the proceeds will go towards the city's low-income housing or equitable development funds. The resolution is adopted, then the chair will sign it. Please read the next... Yeah, let's clap on that. The surplus land measure is cause for celebration for the council and El Centro de la Raza Executive Director Estela Ortega. I see it as a great opportunity. Ortega oversaw the development of Plaza Roberto Maestas, a project that used an abandoned school obtained during activist occupation in 1972 and turned it into housing, a place for small businesses and childcare, and a cultural center in 2016. I had one of our donors tell me, you, you, you're, not, you're not building just affordable housing, you are creating community. And that is truly what we did. The plaza is somewhat unique. It's right next to a light rail station, and it went through an extended community vetting process. It took seven and a half years of planning. But Ortega is hopeful the city's new surplus land policy will streamline the process and provide the affordable housing she says is critical to keeping Seattle economically and ethnically diverse. Seattle continues to grow and people are continually being pushed out of the city, so you've got to come up with some creative, creative options. The city council is getting creative with a state law passed in early 2018 that says agencies can sell land at below market value all the way down to zero dollars. That could be a huge boost, says Seattle's Office of Housing which received $245 million worth of project applications this year, but had only $70 million to disperse. Land and access to land is one key piece of affordable housing development, and we appreciate the leadership and collaboration in helping to reduce barriers on that one key piece. But there's been a concern the city could face a lawsuit following state Supreme Court cases that may indicate proceeds from the sale of properties owned by utilities, for example, should go to ratepayers. And that's not all. It just seems like a big missed opportunity. Katie Wilson is a longtime Seattle activist working with the Mercer Mega Block Alliance, which had hoped to push the city towards redoing its request for proposals on a three acre site in South Lake Union. In an ideal world, we would be keeping this whole parcel public. But the city has bonded against the sale of this land to pay for road work on Mercer Street 
and to put money towards its homelessness response. The fact that the city did um, use money against the anticipated sale means that we just we don't have much of a choice in a way at this point. But that doesn't mean Wilson won't continue to push the city to consider affordable housing in all its land use decisions. I think this policy is really important because it's really a statement of our city's values and as we move forward, um, any any land that is developable will be will be able to make sure that, um, that that's done in the right way. When you have land values that are escalating the way they are, um, it just drives up the cost. Cindy Proctor, VP of Development for Beacon Development Group, which worked closely with El Centro on the Roberto Maestas project, is supportive of the city's new policy. We should be looking at this as urban infill. But also has concerns. There's a lot of sensitivity around this. First, there's the 2015 study that showed of 210 surplus properties in Seattle, only 33 were suitable for affordable housing development. The scale of the need is so large that it, it's going to continue to be one of the challenges that the city of Seattle has. Plus, with potential political battles over where affordable housing could be built and which communities have the capacity to sustain such projects, Proctor says the city's new land policy will be put to the test. This is going to allow some production. This isn't going to solve anything but we're going to be going in a, a negative direction if something like this isn't implemented, if land isn't preserved. The city government can do anything, but we can't do everything. It's a fact the council is well aware of. In a rapidly growing city, trying to dig its way out of an affordable housing crisis. People who work in this city deserve to live in the city. This is a piece of lots of pieces that need to come together. It just makes our city a worse place when we don't have housing that, that people can afford. Joining us to discuss this issue further, we have with us Council Member Teresa Mosqueda of the Seattle City Council. Teresa, as always, good to have you. Good to be here. Thank you. We also have James Madden. He is Senior Program Director for Enterprise Community Partners. James, good to have you, too. Thank you. And here we go with Leslie Morishita. She is Real Estate Development Director for Interim CDA. And we'll talk a little bit about your groups in a little bit. Leslie, good to have you, too. Thank you. I wanted to start with you, Council Member Mosqueda. You've shepherded this legislation through the City Council. You were first focused just on city light surplus land back in July. Then we had the resolution covering all types of city land, city land this fall. I just want to go to this big question. Why was it important for the council to act on this issue of surplus land as it relates to affordable housing? What does this resolution mean for our city? Well, first of all, this resolution is rooted in what community has been asking for for a very long time. We wanted to make sure that we were being smart with public land and utilizing that public land when it's surplus for the public good, creating affordable housing and plazas and grocery stores and child care facilities mm -hmm. and opportunities for families to be together and play near transit hubs so that we can create an interconnected community. We don't have enough housing in the city. The community said when the city has public land, the first priority should be affordable housing and it should be done through the community's lens, meaning the community leads with the development design, identifying what they want to see on site, and actually um, take the reins in terms of developing it through their own priorities. Um, organizations like Interim, organizations like Enterprise, they have been at the table asking for this for a very long time. We needed to act with urgency because um, past administrations have used the sale of land to plug budget holes. We need to be thinking about the future and building the housing that our community needs now and in 20 years from now. Thank you very much for that. James, I'll get your background on this. Mm -hmm. Tell us briefly about what community, excuse me, Enterprise Community Partners does and why you think this issue of surplus land is so important. Sure, yeah. So we're a national nonprofit that supports affordable housing and community development <coughs> through almost every means. And locally, our focus is an initiative we're calling Home and Hope, mm -hmm. which is focused on transforming public and tax exempt sites into affordable homes and early learning centers, mm -hmm. taking the resource we have in a very resource constrained environment mm -hmm. to turn it into something that we all need. And that's definitely more housing in this region. It's more opportunities for quality, affordable childcare and early learning. And as the counselor said, health centers, grocery stores, everything, um, land is a resource we can control and we should be putting it to these things that we need. Thank you very much for that. Leslie, to you next, please explain a little bit about what interim does and what does this surplus land resolution mean to you and your group? All right, well, so big picture, Interim is um, a community development corporation that's been around for almost 50 years, mm -hmm. focused on fighting to you know, protect and preserve the international district, for, especially on behalf of the low-income mm -hmm. immigrants and refugees that are there. And so uh, we've been developing our own low-income housing for about 30 years now. 
And, um, you know, right now, with the economy the way it is, acquiring land is the biggest hurdle to getting a housing project off the ground. So we see this legislation as extremely meaningful. Mm -hmm. It's the right thing to do. Okay, um, I'm gonna break down some of those details in a bit, but thank you for okay. that background. So Teresa, this is a very complex issue, as you well know. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna try to pull a few pieces of this apart, and I'll start with this. How many of these potential properties are there here in Seattle? There was this report in the Times three years ago showed there were a few hundred of them, maybe 33 were suitable for affordable housing. So I'm trying to figure out how many of these we might be looking at now. Are there enough locations to really make a dent in our affordable housing crisis? So you're asking the same question I asked a year ago when I came into council, and I asked, show me a map of all parcels of publicly owned land, and let's start the effort so that we can put organizations like Interim mm -hmm. at the forefront so that they can have access to land and build affordable housing. Housing. The answer I received was, we don't yet have that map. Here we are now, mm -hmm. and Enterprise has yeah. pulled together a map, an interactive tool that shows us all parcels of publicly owned land. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about city, county, yep. state, school board, nonprofit, church owned land. Yeah. So now we have that map, and the map shows us yes, we can make a dent, we can build housing, and not just in one area of the city, throughout the city, so that people can have access to community rich neighborhoods where they have access to libraries mm -hmm. and transit yeah. and schools, maybe a community pool. We can create opportunities for folks if, when we create more affordable housing and do it throughout the city. So now we have the map. We have the tool that makes sure that we're cutting uh, the cost of production. When you make available public land and you reduce the cost of land in the construction overall cost, it can be reduced by about 15 percent. That's a huge cost savings and it makes it possible for us to invest those dollars into creating more affordable housing yeah. and to do it with urgency. Big deal, especially with these multi-million dollar projects. And James, let's talk about this map for ECP sure. here. Uh, this is part of the Home and Hope Initiative. I want to talk about what types of properties are out mm -hmm. there just to help people picture this and also go over some of the challenges, please, from environmental concerns to the size of the properties that can make some constraints on affordable housing too. Yeah. And it, it started with this question of where are the properties, how many are there, are they really suitable for affordable housing? And as we engage with stakeholders to think about what they need out of a tool, it became apparent very quickly that different people were looking for different things. Mm -hmm. And past efforts had looked at stuff that was only officially surplused, but you might have a surface parking lot sitting in a very good location. It's not surplus, but maybe it should be more than a surface parking lot. Mm -hmm. Or you had efforts that looked at only parcels big enough for a large apartment building, and we have great nonprofits building affordable homes, townhomes for sale to middle and low income people in the city. And they're saying, what about us? We know that there's these couple thousand square foot sites out there. So we built a tool and we just started from what is every site in King County that is tax exempt, so public or nonprofit mm -hmm. or church ownership yeah. within the urban growth area and not obviously undevelopable. So mm -hmm. not steep slope, underwater, yeah. water, yeah. space needle, something you just wouldn't want right, to touch. Right. Right. And it came out with about 11,000 sites mm -hmm. that we can then further filter by size, by what kinds of environmental conditions, by zoning. Is it near transit? Mm -hmm. Is it near another school or other affordable housing? Okay. Is it um, an eligibility area for different funding tools to really give communities and developers like Interim yeah. the opportunity to say, what is here and what can we do? <clears throat> Thank you. And I know there's a lot of work still to whittle down that list and figure out what's next. But Leslie, I do want to talk about this. This very important part of this resolution that directs the Office of Housing to partner with community-based organizations like yours. <laughs> and there, there's, there's a big deal, I know. And, and these are we're talking about areas where there is this high risk of displacement. I want to talk about more specifically your experience in the CID. What is it like to try to dis prevent displacement there? I know it's difficult in this market. I want to get your perspective. It's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we're, the CID right now is facing an unprecedented amount of um, specu speculative developments coming yeah. in from mm -hmm. outside because of its location next to downtown and near the tra regional transit hub. It's, it's the hot spot for, yeah. for speculative developers. So um, at the same time, the CID has a very large population of elders, low income, mm -hmm. many immigrants and refugees. It's a very diverse population, yeah. and it's traditionally been a first stop for immigrants coming into the city. And yeah. it's um, into this country, yeah. Yeah, and it's there's a whole network of community-based organizations that have developed in response to the population there that provide. Uh, culturally relevant services, and then the retail and commercial and cultural institutions, all it's this network yeah. of cultural, social, and economic relationships mm -hmm. 
that is, um, so it's not, it, housing is a very key piece of it, right. but it's it's not just housing. It's right. we're facing all kinds of displacement. I see. There's all needs for many different you know, things. It's yeah. the fabric of the community. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, Teresa. I just want to take a quick moment yeah. to recognize the language that you just read because interim was key in making sure that that <laughs> yeah. language was included yeah. in the legislation. In fact, when we were having some planning meetings, mm -hmm. you brought up this language that had been incorporated as a late amendment to the HALA and MHA mm -hmm. discussions in the Central District and International District. And because we want to make sure that the policies really translate into meaningful change on the ground level, right. not just saying development should be done through the community lens, but explaining and dictating what that means. Yeah. It means that organizations who are at the front of the line should represent the communities yeah. that they're intending to serve. Yeah. It means their board and their leadership should look like the communities that they're rooting new change in. And yeah. it means that development doesn't have to equal displacement if it's really done through the community's lens and the community has site control. So it is a collaborative effort and that language okay. that we wrote uh, into the law really came from these types of conversations. We wanted to know what worked and what was yeah. needed and that was what was needed. I want to talk about this a little further and ask a difficult question here. I'm talking about the different groups that are out there that are looking for help. One concern is there are a number of low-income communities, communities of color in Seattle who might not have organizations like Interim or El Centro to help them out. How do you help groups who might not have that expertise or capacity, as I've heard it called sometimes, to build and sustain these development projects? So you are hitting on the next step in this process. The first step was making sure that the land was available and that we prioritized affordable housing, prioritized affordable housing with the amenities that you heard about earlier, mm -hmm. child care, health facilities, yeah. small women and minority-owned businesses on the first floor, community centers, and other um, public spaces for gathering. And in order to make sure that organizations can actually fulfill the vision of the, uh, the housing and the development that they want, we need to make sure that people can meet that asset mm -hmm. test that often our city puts um, uh, in front of prospective developers. Right. A lot of times our community wants to develop the Roberto Maestra Plaza that you showed mm -hmm. earlier, but it took Roberto Maestra Plaza yeah. seven years to get the approval and for the ground to break. We have a crisis of housing now. Yeah. We have to do a much better job of breaking down the red tape. Mm -hmm. And in order to do that, we also have to make sure that organizations have access to capital. That's part of what the um, Equitable <coughs> Development Initiative will do. Right. That's part of what we're trying to do as well with the measure that I have in the budget this year mm -hmm. that bonds against the short-term rental tax. Okay, one at a time here. here allows for yeah, more right. dollars than right, hand right, right. because really it is yeah. about resources. Mm -hmm. It's about the assets, um, making sure that people feel like they can check those boxes and that they have the support so that they can build yeah. now. This is also a huge part yeah, of please, yeah. what we do on a day-to-day -day basis. Mm -hmm. We run a small grant program that helps these organizations. We were uh, one of the first grantors to um, El Centro for the Plaza Project. Mm -hmm. um, and then when it opened, we gave them another grant to work through how do you be a good owner and mm -hmm. be a great steward of this over the long term. Yeah. Um, we help put together those partnerships. Yeah. Um, that partnership between El Centro and Beacon was so key to getting an outcome that I call the most inspiring place in Seattle. It is. I, I just look at that, though, and I wonder how to replicate it. And I know everybody wants We're that trying. secret sauce there, <laughs> but I think about that. It took seven years for it to get off the ground. Mm -hmm. It just so happens to be right next to light rail. How do you replicate something like that? Because it seems like such a unique site. I'm thinking about the Plaza Maestas. I think it's looking towards where is next? Where are the great sites next to light rail or other community yeah. amenities? Who are the leaders in those communities yeah. and how do we support them, stand them up, um, give them the training they need, the money they need, and build the trusted partnerships that are really important to actually get these homes built. Yeah, and, and Leslie, I wanna to go to you for another difficult question here. Yeah. What does affordable mean? Because I know you work with a lot of different people who mm -hmm. might be in the 30% range of area median income, maybe the 60% range. We have such a fast growing economy, displacement is very real as you know. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering how Seattle's approach to surplus land might impact these difficult decisions that have to be made. Uh, thanks for asking that question. It's a question we are constantly asking because there's, the term affordable is thrown around a lot. And for us, when we're talking about displacement, it's, uh, we think it's very important to, to um, target the affordability to the incomes of the people who are being displaced in a particular locale. Yeah, yeah. okay. So, so that, it, 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 it goes depends. in a pretty wide range there. Okay, <laughs> yeah. okay. 
please. Also, maybe mm-hmm. important to note um, when we talk about housing as well, housing is permanent housing. We're talking about homes. We're talking about apartments, mm-hmm. uh, maybe flats, opportunities for families to be there, maybe multi generational opportunities for people to stay in place. Um, and yes, of course, our city right now has a homelessness crisis as well, um, and perhaps some of the surplus land or vacant land could be used as a very short-term measure to create opportunities for folks to have the shelter that they need. But when we talk about housing, we want the brick and mortar, yeah. long-term, permanent housing so that people have the support that they need. Thank you very much for that. Teresa. I want to stay with you and touch on the concerns of the Mercer Mega Block Alliance here. This is a group pushing the city to apply this new surplus land policy to this three-acre spot in South Lake Union and get new proposals for that land. It doesn't appear that's going to happen, but I want to make sure I let people know. At the same time, affordable housing is definitely still part of the discussion around this location. Can you give us an overview on what's happening with the Mercer Mega Block? Well, I'll give you the little bit of the slice that I've been involved in. Yeah. The RFPs already went out for various developers to bid on. Um, the reality is there is a choice to be made. Instead of selling a parcel of land, one question that I've been asking is, can we master lease it? Mm. Can we hold that land in public hands still and require as a conditionality of building on there that we get more affordable housing, that we have more space for community to enjoy. And that way the land does stay in public hands. I know some of the organizations who've been involved in these conversations longer may have other visions, but one of the things that I want to make sure is we build affordable housing on site, um, we keep the land in public hands if possible, and any building that does happen, we get the incentive zoning, we get the MHA payment so that we can build more housing throughout the city and that those dollars really result in affordable housing uh, in Seattle. It doesn't look like a redo is happening though. I want to make sure I'm clear on that. as far as we know. Um, well, I'm, I'm, I'm going to check in uh, okay. <laughs> with the executive soon. Yeah. I know that they know this is an issue that we've been watching yep. cl- and tracking closely as yeah. well. And, and let me just uh, finish up with this. The, the basic idea I'm trying to get to, I'm trying to figure out, and I know it's a math problem sometimes, do you get more bang for the buck if you sell a property at top dollar? Maybe you get a lot of money coming in because developers do have to pay into that affordable housing fund. Or is it a better, better deal for the city to have the f- affordable housing units built? I know that's a big back and forth for the council. Yeah, I think yeah. it's a, both a question of um, how do we incentivize folks to build on site, yeah. and if they are not going to build on site, how much can we get in return? Yeah. One concern that we have right now is um, affordable housing developers, by and large, really do create more like seven-story units, yeah. uh, five over two units. And what I think we would like to do, I, what I would love to do, is try to figure out ways that we as a city can help incentivize so that organizations that are thinking about affordable housing, that are prioritizing affordable housing for the community that they are right. rooted in, have the ability to do steel and glass frames so that mm-hmm. we can create more opportunities for people to live right. in this city and create the density that we need. Uh, James bringing you in here. Mm-hmm. The Mercer Mega Block, I think, speaks to this issue of community groups really asking local government to tackle the big problem of affordable housing and do it creatively. What do you see about this? Is this a situation where in the future this surplus land resolution tool is going to be something that advocates can really use? How do you look at that? Absolutely. We, it'll be the tool that we use to get at this. And it goes to the core of the question around using public sites for affordable housing. Mm-hmm. Is it sure it can buy you a discounted price? It might save you 10, 15 percent. Um, off the total cost of the housing, which in turn saves our city's housing levy to be applied for more homes. Right. Or it can buy you location. Mm-hmm. Um, and a great example that is moving forward is Sound Transit has a similar law. It's required to put its surplus property out for affordable housing. Yeah. And it used that to give away a site on First Hill for free yeah. that Plymouth and Bellwether Housing will be constructing the city's first high rise affordable housing in. So you look at sites like the Mercer Mega Block near a tremendous number of jobs that people can walk to. Yeah. And I walk by the site every day because yeah. I don't live too far away and mm-hmm. it's on the way. And it should be part of that and we should have at least something there for working people to live in that neighborhood. Thank you very much for that. Leslie, this whole idea of public lands and public hands, that's the phrase I keep hearing here. I, I want to talk about this advocacy, what it might look like. Having a seat at the table is another phrase I hear a lot of. What's that going to look like? Interim actually having a seat at the table with the city with these land use decisions. The biggest tool to fight displacement is community control of land. That's where it's at, because communities know what they need, and it, it's permanent, and um, you know, no community is going to sell out and kick everybody out. Right. They yeah. know what they need, so right. and I, that's the Gordon, what this is about. I was thinking so. about the Gordon Hira, Hira, Hirabayashi uh, property there. That, mm-hmm. ha, that's a really good example of, of community coming together and, and finding a place that worked for everyone. Yeah, and that was, so, so that was three parcels that were acquired over a period of seven years. Okay, all right. At a time when land was much more affordable. Right, 
Right. Um, so so the, that's part of the equation too here. <laughs> I, 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 yeah, please. There is a really great opportunity that um, I, uh, Interim has really identified for us as this next step. I mentioned the first step. Yeah. The next step is really what Interim and other community organizations have said that we need. And it is together to come around the table to rewrite the administration and finance plans for the Office of Housing mm -hmm. because we shouldn't have a seven-year process right. for the CID, for El Centro. We shouldn't have to have communities saying, look, I came before and here's my list and now I have these other questions I have to answer. Mm -hmm. We need to make it more possible for community organizations to really have a facilitator, almost a navigator that just helps expedite the process so that yeah. you can get to building and housing the people that are getting displaced. It sounds good. We need to start wrapping up the show. Leslie, I'll start with you and we'll go down the line. I want to think 10 years into the future. I know the King County Housing Consortium says Seattle needs more than 10,000 units for very low income people by that point. What impact do you think this surplus land policy is going to have on that housing gap? Well, I think, as I said before, community control of land. There's going to be land that's in community control that is going to help stem displacement. That's, um, it's, it's not the only thing, but we have to do everything we can right now because the problem is so big. Very true. James, your thoughts about the impact 10 years from now? As yeah, well. I don't think we get there without this. As land prices continue to rise, um, sites that are in control of public agencies at all levels of government or by other mission-driven groups like nonprofits and religious groups, they'll be the only places we'll be able to afford to build in good locations, and we absolutely need this. Got it. Teresa, looking forward here, I know some new legal waters that the city's going into with this and trying to enable it. Also looking to work with King County, the port, other agencies to try to get them on board and make sure that their surplus land is on the table. Where do you see this policy 10 years from now? Well, really, this was one key piece of the puzzle. The next will be making sure that community organizations can get the resources they need to build and that we expedite the process. The other reality is we don't have the resources we need right now, and we must continue to advocate for progressive reform so that we have the revenue that we need in hand so organizations can have access to the capital and the assets. We have $270 million worth of an ask out there for housing that is ready to go next year. And at this point in the budget, we only have $70 million. It breaks my heart because organizations are ready to go. The land is available. The housing is needed, and we don't have the revenue, so we have to fight for progressive Aggressive revenue reform with urgency again. Okay, thank you very much, all of you, for this feedback, and we will be right back. It's land that's not being used, so give, give it, give it. I don't know if you would give it away. I mean, there, there could be some projections on how it could earn some money. Build a homeless camp. I think the city should use the uh, surplus land for a park. We'd like to know what you think. Send us an email at contact at seattlechannel.org or find us on Facebook and Twitter and give us your feedback. Before we close today, it's time for our weekly CIO poll. What should the city do with its surplus land? Sell it at full market value? Give it away for affordable housing? Or are you unsure? We want to know what you think. Cast your vote and send us your comments at our website, seattlechannel.org slash cityinsideout. While you're there, you can watch our programs online anytime. Coming up next week, the public charge controversy. A Trump administration proposal to make it harder to stay in the U.S. if you use public benefits like food stamps is having a chilling effect on low-income immigrants. We go behind the headlines next time on City Inside Out. I hope you join us.